imagine a scientist. Perhaps a picture like this comes to your mind. A person inside the lab, working with a very technical instrument and collecting some data. Maybe you imagine the scientist in between, collecting some samples and so on. What if I asked you, can a scientist be a person with a, uh, with a pencil, with a paintbrush? Would you accept it? Because of the work I do, I often get asked to compare art and science. And deliberating on this question has also allowed me to answer this one. We start by looking at the art of thought. It has been devised as a four-step process, starting with preparation. This is the information gathering stage, where one observes, documents, reads up, and collects all the information as is possible. Followed by a step of incubation. This is when you start to assimilate the information you have gathered. What follows is illumination. This is the step where suddenly things make sense, and out of nowhere, a new idea emerges. And it probably happens to you when you least expect it in front of the mirror, in the shower, or while walking the dog. What follows this is this phase of implementation. This is the laborious part of doing, of making, of figuring out how these ideas can be placed in the real world, where they work and where they don't. And maybe can they lend themselves to some other ideas, new or old. And what one finds is that on this four-step process, one could easily overlay the four steps of scientific thinking and scientific doing. But in both these parallels, it's a step between analysis of existing information, the hypothesis building, the, the step or the continuum between illumination, so incubation and illumination, that's the most interesting. Because this is where the real creativity occurs. This is where there is a leap, there is an eruption existing information, observation, become generalizations. Archimedes comes to mind soaking in his bathtub when he suddenly screams Eureka, for he finally figured out why some things float in water and others sink. Something similar happened to Karen Mullis as he drove towards woods along the valley. He figured out, he knew, he was close to this answer, answer of figuring out the logic to what we now call the polymerase chain reaction, the one that we currently use to detect the presence of virus in our bodies. In both these cases, the inside came after a pause, a distraction. So looking away seems like a great way to finding a new idea. What else can one do? How else to generate such illuminations? And indulgence in art practices seems like another prescription. Einstein and his body come to mind. Elsa, his wife, described how Einstein would come out of his study, play the violin for some time, and then head back again to continue his work. One wonders, if Einstein did not have this musical proclivity, would he have still come up with the theory of relativity? A tough call to make. An easier one can be made in the case of Galileo Galilei. He was the one who made his intricate drawings of the surface of the moon. He was first, first amongst his peers to show the presence of craters and the shadows thereof. Interestingly, Galileo and his peers were using very similar telescopes, but he was the one who noticed this. So what set him apart? It was his training in the classical painting. Training in classical painting allowed him to observe carefully the light and shadows and document them. In the story of Einstein and in the story of Galileo, there is one fundamental difference. The playing of violin did not contribute to the domain-specific task that Einstein had on his hand. Whereas in the case of Galileo, the drawing, his artistic proclivities very much contributed to the task he had at his hand. Currently, most scientists rely on domain knowledge, its skills, its tools, its protocols, its methods to guide their work. And what this leads to is uh, expected, of course, useful solutions. Scientific creativity, on the other hand, requires originality 
and an element of surprise, a part of course uh, the utility of the generated IPO. There are some surprising discoveries that we fashionably call serendipitous discoveries like the penicillin or the X-ray. If however, the, the originality and the surprise level for a discovery is high, that's a truly creative solution. And it's a little ironic that the scientific method, our goal, our polished to reduce this element of chance, to reduce this element of surprise, because we're looking for an answer to a question in a very controlled manner. So which leaves little room for the unexpected. And even if the unexpected does occur, the noticing or the utilizing of this unexpected is rare. How could then one increase the possibility of creative solutions in science? The answer comes from relying on diversity of methods than the ones that are described by the specific domain. And based on, of my, based on my work, I recommend hand drawing. Hand drawing has the possibility of generating sight, insight, understanding, and sharing of that understanding. So now, I'll ask you to think with me. I'm going to vocalize a form, and I would like you to imagine that form. A long, flexible tube with a lot of bulges, contortions, convolutions, and pouches at a very specific place along the tube. It starts with a wide funnel-like opening followed by a straight section with a slightly narrow diameter. It ends up in a wide bean-mat shaped pouch which then is followed by a highly convoluted portion of the tube. Here it might give the appearance of being knotted but it is not. It then leads to a wider segment that starts at a vertically low point, runs back up almost to the midway of the whole structure, takes a 90 degree turn and now spans across the whole width of this structure, takes another 90 degree turn, comes back down, ends in a very small pouch with a very tight wall. This structure is part of the human body. Did you imagine this picture of the human digestive system? That's at least what I was trying to describe. So even if our articulation and descriptions happen in words, the mental processing of ideas and the building of connections happens in the very intangible forms of visuals and experiences. What is often harder is the ability to share what we conjure in images as we think and as we imagine. Darwin starts his sentence, I think, but ends not, not in words, but in illustration, the illustration of Tree of Life. And this goes on to show that visual displays are not only a relevant part of scientific communication, but of scientific thinking and the process of generation of scientific facts themselves. If I bring you back to this fourth set process of art of thought, one realizes that drawing can let itself to utility at all of these four stages. Given his work, for example, very well sits in the preparation phase, which is all about observation and documentation. This, this image created by Waddington is a visual metaphor where the surface is being modulated by a network of strings connected to pegs. And the idea is to generate thought about the fate of the cell, which is lying on the surface as a ball, not visible in this image. Waddington cheekily said that his work is to stimulate a, a visual thought and loosen the joints of scientists' imagination. And we all are probably aware of scientists and innovators who doodle, who draw for leisure, or maybe during a talk like this. Then bringing you to my own work of on a specific biological molecule inside the living cell, I drew and I operated outside the pragmatic constraints of experimental methods. I could think beyond what was allowed. I could expand the possibility of the questions that I asked. And this act of summarizing the available data in a set of images gives theoretical proofs for some, 
and built some new hypothesis, which then became the raw material for experimental biologists to work on. So artistic pursuits, particularly hand drawing, can contribute directly to the domain-specific requirements across disciplines, including natural sciences, engineering, architecture, and other interdisciplinary domains. However, asking the scientists to draw is a difficult task. In the talks and workshops I've led, often scientists say, I can't draw. Well, I think anyone can draw. And particularly in this case, because the drawing we ask of here is about the process of thinking, is what goes behind the discovery, as, and is not so much about sharing that discovery. However, if a scientist still felt reluctant to draw, here is my solution. Collaborate. Collaborate with artists who can draw. Collaborating with artists will not only include citizens to the fold of discoverers and bring their skills of observations and documentation to the scientific process, collaborating with them also take you to a fearless place where anything is possible. And you find new things, new ideas, new insights. And of course, the obvious interaction between artists and scientists can lead to science communication outcomes where you are able to share your work with a wider audience. They bring not only their technical skills with drawing, but also an acute empathy and understanding of the need of the audiences. So yeah, somebody with a pipette, sorry, somebody with a pencil or a paintbrush could very well be a scientist. If you are looking to arrive at a breakthrough or a paradigm shift in your work, take a break, indulge in an artistic practice, or even better, start drawing. A scientist with a pencil or someone who collaborates with an artist with a pencil is going to cause a revolution. So get going and think afresh with your pencil in your hand. Thank you.